This is a special day in the city of Dallas, in the state of Texas, USA. It is what the Americans call Thanksgiving, the 342nd anniversary of the day the first British settlers put aside to give thanks to God for their new home, new life, new hopes. But in Dallas, where the people probably have more riches to give thanks for than any other city on earth, there is no thankfulness. For, as everyone knows, it was here, at this spot, that President Kennedy was shot down. And it was here, in the basement of this police station, that the little man accused of killing him was shot down in turn. Shot by the man who operates this strip tease joint, the Carousel Burlesque House. It is Thanksgiving Day in Dallas, World in Action reports. For thousands of people, Thanksgiving begins in church. But James R. Allen, preaching at the Tyler Street Church, was not giving thanks. Let's mark out the pattern of hate, for if we would be free from the disease of hatred, we must diagnose its symptoms and discover its causes and apply the necessary remedies. The basic root of hatred is sin. Hatred is basically rooted in the sinfulness of the human heart. From the time God warned Cain, that sin crouches at the door, where it is spring. Just before our hatred drove Cain to the murder of his brother, and to an answer of no when he heard God say yes, that he was his brother's keeper. To this good day, man's proud rebellion of heart against God has been the breeder of hate. Hate is a word Dallas has had to get used to in the last few days. The columnist Doris Fleeson describes the city as one of the hate capitals of the world. The New York Post says of Dallas, This is a city of grief and guilt and hate. And President Johnson, who described the assassination of Mr. Kennedy as the foulest deed of our time, caused discomfort in Dallas when he said, Let us put an end to the teaching of hate and evil and violence. That hatred may be more sophisticated in selecting socially approved objects for its venom, but it's the same stuff that triggers a sniper's gun or causes the throwing of a bomb in a Negro Sunday school in Birmingham, Alabama. To those of us who protest that these are not really representative of Dallas, the obvious answer is that they are representative of an element of our city, and the white heat of hate-filled atmosphere allowed the necessary warmth for this element to crawl out from under the rocks to be seen. Odd frustrations like this help to explain perhaps why Dallas not only has the very rich and the very poor, but also the most outspoken political extremists in America. Men like General Walker, who during President Kennedy's administration flew the stars and stripes upside down on his front lawn, who constantly attacks the United Nations, and who sets about the churches. You have much opposition among the clergy who have never owned up to their responsibilities with respect to communist and communism as an atheistic threat to this country. There are more dangerous people, like those who distributed in Dallas loathsome allegations about Mr. Kennedy's private life, all of them lies. Like those who spat on Mr. Adley Stevenson recently. Like those who roughed up Mr. Lyndon Johnson and his wife. On the day of the assassination, the Dallas Morning News, itself right-wing, published an unknown committee's advertisement, which is now being investigated by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, after congressmen described it as... Vicious, cruel, and abusive, the kind of verbiage that tends to incite fanatics. The most extreme group of all is the John Birch Society, militantly anti-Negro, anti-government, anti-United Nations. World in Action visited the home of Mrs. Beth Anderson Rachel, who has done publicity work for the society. I feel keenly uh, the personal loss of Mr. Kennedy. Uh, many of my friends and I disagreed with him, just diametrically, politically, and I do not feel the loss in that respect. We uh, disagree with an, uh, an extensive federal program of aid, financial aid, to the people of the states. We feel that this should be handled primarily by the states if there needs to be any aid. We think the American people are just quite capable of shouldering their own responsibilities, whether it be 
their school lunch programs or their age of their aged relatives or dependent relatives of whatever nature. We certainly disagreed with him on the, in the area of foreign affairs, particularly in his support of the United Nations, which uh, many of my associates uh, and I feel is just about the worst instrument to have hit this earth. Uh, we disapprove of sitting down and collaborating with people who are known to be our enemies. Uh, we wouldn't think at the local level of sitting down and conniving, if you will, with robbers, murderers, thieves. And so we don't feel that we should do this on a national or an international level. Federal aid or the shouldering of the people's responsibilities uh, taking on the responsibilities that people should assume for themselves leads, we feel quite strongly, to uh, a police state. This is uh, the overall federal uh, approach to persons' responsibilities. We think of it, or often refer to it, as big daddy government. We talked about extremists to the mayor of Dallas, Mr. Earl Cabell, who is inevitably a millionaire. Now we have extremists on the one side uh, that want no participation whatsoever by the federal government in the affairs of the nation that are not matters of national defense, for instance. Uh, those are known as the extreme right. Uh, we have another group on the other end of that spectrum uh, that want the federal government to take over all uh, of the operation of business, railroads, uh, and uh, let the federal government uh, operate uh, our municipal and state governments. Those are the extreme liberal. Uh, both of those groups are definitely in the minority in so long, insofar as our whole population are concerned, uh, but they are rather articulate. They are certainly vocal. And the fact that uh, they do make a lot of noise, they sometimes give the impression uh, that they are greater in numbers than they actually are. The mayor was echoed by Captain Glenn King, spokesman for the Dallas Police Department. We have within the department a criminal intelligence unit whose responsibility it is to investigate the activities of these groups and to uh, maintain a current state of intelligence on them. We have people who are, are racists and we have people who, who believe in the supremacy of one group over another group. These, these are not unusual. We haven't, we haven't any kind of... of uh, extremist group here that you won't find anywhere else and the, the pattern or the path or the, the trend that they follow is the, is the trend that you find everywhere in the world. Another man keen to talk about the political outsiders is Mr. Tom Howard, the cigar smoking lawyer who is defending Jack Ruby accused of murdering the assassin Oswald. Mr. Howard's office is opposite police headquarters and more than 50 alleged murderers have come to him for help. Well, I don't know. I think he went out of town for Thanksgiving. It could be that he won't be back till Saturday, but uh, his partner, Mr. Anderson, might be there. He has saved them all from the death sentence. Yes, well, they know how to handle that. The extremists in uh, Dallas are like this. They are, they are primarily the John Birch Society group. Uh, they have received a great deal of encouragement, particularly from one of our local newspapers. Uh, I might say this, that the, uh, this group is a, is a very small group and do not represent the views of the majority of the people of Dallas by any means. Uh, but, uh, as I said, they have in, uh, been encouraged by people that have a great deal of wealth, that have very extreme right-wing views. Of course, extremists are not typical of the people of Dallas, but they have their influence. The Reverend Wilfred Bailey, minister of the Carserview Methodist Church, spoke to us after his Thanksgiving service about what happened at his daughter's school on the day President Kennedy was shot. I want to tell you about my daughter, Linda, who is a 16-year-old student in one of the high schools here in Dallas. Experience which she had is not an isolated experience, but when the news of the president's assassination was told in her school, she was shocked to find a few students, I'm glad to say a very few students, 
who expressed real joy at this. Now, this happened not only in her school, but it has happened in other schools here in Dallas and I'm sure in other cities across the nation. Now, the reason for children behaving like this, obviously, is because of a home situation. A child, immature, is not able to adjust, as one person has said, from hearing much abuse and prejudice at home suddenly to a recognition of a tragedy. But we are not saying that the school children are in any way barbaric, but they responded simply spontaneously out of after hearing a period of time abuse heaped upon a person and to hear the person in being shot, this was their immediate reaction. Incidentally, the two Dallas newspapers carried denials that the children cheered. Although the New York Times published the full story and also reported that the first minister to reveal it was given police protection. The reason that we are concerned about this is because we want Dallas to be aware of the guilt that's on it. Now, we're aware that the assassination was the act of one man, or possibly one man, but this is not our concern at this time. This is something of which we have no control. But all of us as citizens of Dallas do have much to say about the kind of climate which can encourage this sort of thing. Other cities in the United States and other cities in the world have to answer for themselves. We in Dallas do not want to try to pretend that we've not contributed to this kind of thing. The statement that's been made by a Methodist pastor here in Dallas is a good statement and one that we back totally. That is, that Dallas does have much for which it must answer. The newspapers reported that in his cell in the city courthouse, Jack Ruby ate a hearty Thanksgiving meal. But shortly afterwards, his lawyer, Tom Howard, said... Uh, he's always, to my way of thinking, been on the verge of a nervous breakdown or what we call a nervous crack-up sometimes. Uh, he's uh, just the type of a man that uh, the uh, events that have occurred in the past uh, uh, 48 hours before Oswald's death uh, would affect a man of Ruby's men mental condition. He's just the kind of a man that would uh, become terribly mentally disturbed and mentally deranged by a thing like this. Of course, in every Dallas home, Thanksgiving dinner was haunted by three questions. First, why did it have to happen here? Some Dallas people, like the Reverend Wilfred Bailey, say that the climate of the city was such as to encourage a fanatic. That extreme politics over years had poisoned the place. Also, it was a fact that Mr. Kennedy knew he was venturing into enemy territory. His trip was designed to rally again his waning supporters. Secondly, was 24-year-old Lee Harvey Oswald the man who killed Mr. Kennedy? And if so, why? The evidence of fingerprints of opportunity of the rifle itself suggests he did. Certainly he was capable of killing, as the honor roll of policemen killed on duty will soon testify. For in the last remaining space will soon go the name of Patrolman Tippett, seen by witnesses to be shot dead by Oswald. Why might Oswald do it? It is now clear beyond doubt that he was not only a most unpleasant young man, but an unstable one. He was clearly unbalanced. Most observers on the spot reject the idea that Oswald was either a hired assassin or that he acted as key man in a cruel plot. He was too unreliable for either proposition. The third and last question is, how could the police allow another unstable man with criminal tendencies, Jack Ruby, to shoot Oswald in the basement of police headquarters? The mayor, Mr. Cabell, offers one explanation. Uh, there was a terrific amount of uh, confusion uh, due to the hundreds of uh, media people, television cameras, uh, again. That was not done for the sake, the, the uh, permitting those television people in there and the news media people was not done for purposes of publicity, but was done in order to let the world know that Oswald was being properly treated in order that when he was brought to trial, there could not be the accusation that he was brutally treated or that his rights were in any way uh, taken away from him. Uh, he was shown to news people uh, regularly so that they would know uh, that he was being treated properly. 
Uh, then, of course, when this one man was able to break that cordon, uh, that's just one of those things that, uh, may I say, that uh, a football team with a terrific line, sometimes a fullback can break that line uh, where you would think it would be an impossibility. That would be comparable to this situation. For families who stayed at home on Thanksgiving night, there was a macabre piece of film on television. Dallas police reconstructed the assassination using two stand-ins in a car similar to that used by Mr. Kennedy. But substituting a camera for the rifle in the right-hand window of the fifth floor of the book warehouse. Many people did not stay at home, however. By Thanksgiving night, the assassination was six days old. And like so many of Dallas's businessmen, newspaper men, and hotel men, people were anxious to forget and to believe instead that Big D was a swinging town still. They filled their clubs and the late night restaurants, remembering, of course, to take their own bottles. Only in Jack Ruby's carousel was business slow. The girls worked to a handful of curious sightseers from out of town. The fact of the matter is that, try as it may, Dallas will find it hard to forget what happened here at half past 12 on the 22nd of November, 1963. Indeed, it never will 